to approve minutes from May 7 and June 18. May 7th, it was Dan, Jack, Roger, and Kate were in attendance that evening. Uh, Mr. Chair, I make a motion to approve the minutes of May 7th, uh, 2018. Uh, excuse me, Kevin. You weren't among those folks I just identified. Oh, Mr. Mr. Well, Chairman, I'll, I'll, make the motion, I'll make the motion to approve the minutes of May 7th as printed. I'll second. We have a motion by Jack and a second by Dan. Any discussion amongst those four individuals who uh, qualified oh, to there. adopt the minutes? Yep. Hearing none, all those uh, in favor of the motion, please signify by raising your right hands. Uh, May 7th minutes have been adopted. We also have yeah. June 18th, uh, Dan, Kevin, Jack, and, my, and I were uh, in attendance. Kevin, would you like to make a motion? I'll make that motion for the, uh, for the, uh, the, 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 the most recent minutes. I'll second. A motion by Kevin, second by Jack. All those in favor, please signify by raising your right hands. He was, he was there. Oh, you were. You were. Okay. Sorry, Ron. Um, you appeared as I was going through that. So, um, minutes from June 18th have been adopted. Uh, the next item on agenda is um, conditional use site plan and design review at 27 School Street. Is that him? He's, He's no. Okay. It doesn't appear that there's anyone here at this moment to address that application so we're going to skip 27 school street and move to zero murray hill drive the applicant is uh, john and ken senegal the owner of the properties the murray hill homeowners association who's here to speak on the application start so my name is uh, eric biggelstone um, i have a resident of murray hill i'm also the president of uh, murray hill homeowners association okay eric before you continue is there anyone else who wants to be heard on this matter if so please raise your right hand do you solemnly swear the evidence you're about to give on the matter under consideration is the truth the whole truth and nothing but the truth yes thank you um so again i'm president of murray hill homeowners association um Joan and Ken Senecal were asked by the board, who there are many members here of the board, um, to help us with the process of applying for this permit. They are the owners of Murray Hill Development, which manages a lot of the property up there. They're also um, the people who first developed Murray Hill over 30 years ago, in case you're wondering who they are. Um, so I don't really have much to add to that other than um, let, them, let them take over and uh, provide the information that you, you may need. Does it, uh, is the board of the homeowners association in support of this application? Yes, we are. Yes. Thank you. I thought, I, I, sorry. I'd just like to also add that um, uh, overwhelmingly majority of the residents at Murray Hill are in favor of it as well. We did have a, a vote um, and there was lots of support for it as well. I'm not sure how you prefer to proceed. Uh, should we be seated around the table here? You can if you're, because as the applicant, yes, that would okay. customarily be the case. All right. Uh, by the way, my name is Ken Senecal. We have the... Ken um, Senecal, 420 Murray Hill Drive, Montpelier. Just a moment, we have an um, easel that will facilitate. <laughs> Thanks, Ryan. We just have a couple of brief comments. We've received the staff uh, report, and um, we are essentially in agreement with uh, the entirety of the report. 
Um, we're proposing to take a designation that was placed on one of the plot plans which identified Lot 1 at Murray Hill as being reserved for common land. Um, we would like to have that designation removed and we would like to, uh, once you start uh, taking evidence on the individual items in the staff report, uh, when we reach the appropriate point, we'd like to focus on the minutes of the Planning Commission meeting of October 1, um, 1983. And because I know that you received copies of those by email, but we thought you, some of you may not have printed them out and brought them with you. So we have copies that we would like to just hand out to members. You want to know? Yeah, okay. we might as well get them um, off, people. Just one thing we wanted to add um, in addition to Eric's remarks is we personally, as the former developers at Murray Hill, have no interest in this lot ourselves. We are long past the time where we want to do any development, any building. We are doing this on behalf of the association of which we are members and because of our long history. But we have no interest in the lot ourselves. So while she's passing that out, uh, just to give you uh, some context, uh, Murray Hill was started, yep. the first permit hearings were held in January of 1983. Um, the, we went through sketch plan review, which you still have. Then we went through a process known as conditional review back then. Uh, and we were seeking at that point in time approval for 75 uh, units. They were, the units were a combination of building lots where people would purchase their own lot and build their own home and uh, condominium homes, which uh, we initially intended to sell the right to build those and ended up actually building them ourselves. Um, lot one was approved on July 5th, 1983, and that's indicated in your minutes. and. We also brought copies of the actual zoning permit signed by the uh, city officials uh, if uh, you need that for your records. But the original plan for lot one was that it be a building lot just like any other lot at, uh, that we were developing. And there were no issues raised about that lot during any of the hearings leading up to the original approval. And so lot one became, uh, we had the legal right to sell the lot and someone could build on it. However, Joan and I had uh, one of our major goals at Murray Hill was to stay out of the Meadowland. And we did not like lot number one um, because we felt that it extended farther into the meadowland than we wanted it to. But we also recognized the economic reality that we were doing a big development by Montpelier standards. There was lots of risk involved, a lot of unknowns on whether uh, the that would be strong enough market to support that development. So we uh, decided to satisfy our own interest in not building in the meadow further ourselves, that we would give this approved lot to the homeowners association and that it would become common land, but 
because it had been approved as a lot that the association would treat it as one of its units uh, so that if it ever wanted to raise money, it would have the ability to sell that lot to raise cash. Um, so we, having gotten permits for uh, lot one, along with the other um, units that we proposed initially, we returned to the Planning Commission on October 1, uh, 1984, a little over a year after getting Lot 1 approved, and we told the Planning Commission we have decided to forego our right to build on Lot 1. We're going to deed it to the association and the association has agreed to take ownership of that lot uh, as common land and that the um, association at some point in time might decide to develop the lot um, and it's now reached that point. So this, this sounds like a bit of silliness as I go through it 35 years later uh, but that's what we did. We got a permit to build on a lot and said we really don't want to build on that lot. We're going to give it to the association and that's what we did. Um, so when we get to uh, the appropriate point in the proceedings, I'd like to pull out the October 1, 1984 minutes and go over with you the exact wording of the motion and what it was the Planning Commission intended to approve with respect to the future of Lot 1. Thank you. I have some couple of questions. Um, you received an Act 250 permit for this project? We did. In excess of 10 acres. Oh, yeah. um, did the Act 250 permit address Lot 1? The Act 250 permit uh, approved Lot 1 um, along with uh, 74 units in July of 1983. But Act 250 permits customarily account for all the acreage within a developed parcel. So if you had 100 acres, and you had 40 two-acre lots, Act 250 permit would account for what the developer was going to do with the remaining 20 acres. Right. So how did the Act 250 permit address Lot 1? Uh, initially, it granted a permit for Lot 1, and then uh, just as we did with the Planning Commission, we went back to Act 250. Uh, we sent a cover letter to Ed Stanick, the district coordinator. Uh, we have a copy with us this evening. And in that uh, cover letter, we explained that um, we had decided not to build on Lot 1, but we were reserving our rights to renew the permit application uh, to restore Lot 1 to be a saleable lot. So when the Act 250 permit was written, they identified it as including uh, 75 lots, which included Lot 1, even after we amended it, saying we're, just, we're reserving the right to build on Lot 1, but we don't intend to build on it. They still, when they issued the permit, they said it was for lots one through, I believe it was 48, were applying for a phase. Mm -hmm. So they identified it as a lot even after we informed them we would be uh, conveying it to the association. And it appears on the surveys filed with Act 250. It's always there as one of the original 75 units they approved. The, the area that's shown on the original plan it's called common land that abuts 
Upper Main Street, and it's called 4.327 acres. Yep. It's to the, um, I guess, the south side of the drive, the entranceway. Yep. Does that include or exclude lot one? That uh, excludes. Um, okay, I'm, I'm looking at the as built drawing that the city approved in 1997 as being what was built at Murray Hill, and it identifies the common land as 4.041 acres and lot one as 0.266 acres. So the number you gave me must be the total of those two. I see. So okay. lot one was in that common land. Mr. Sedigal, there's a microphone okay. underneath okay. the map. Yes, oh, so that that's, that's okay. creating the noise. It's the <laughs> abrasion of uh, against the microphone. Thank okay. you. So, so, so map, C. C, map C is yeah, the that's as what built. Ken's referencing right, right, right okay. now. So when was title to this lot conveyed to the Homeowners Association? 1986, February of 1986. <clears throat> because we had to clear some mortgages before we could convey the common elements. And this lot was conveyed at the same time we conveyed all the other common elements, the sewer, the water, the drainage system, the pool, the tennis courts, the, the rest of the common land. Right, and hence the reason for the word reserved being put on lot one. There was a, we're kind of getting into the minute, so, uh, but I think it's important we get this out. Uh, there was an exchange between me and Commission Member Bear about when we went back in October of uh, 1984 and said, we don't want to build on a lot. We have a permit to build on. We want to give it away. And um, she was uh, in favor of approving the application, but she wanted clarity on lot one. If it stayed on the plan, then the developer would have the legal right to sell the lot. But if we put some designation on the lot, then it would be clear that it would be the homeowner's property and that we wouldn't be able to sell the lot. So um, there was discussion about what that label ought to be. And um, it was only after the Planning Commission hearing when our surveyor uh, made the changes in the uh, plan to conform with what the Planning Commission did, had approved, that he put the name reserved lot because we weren't able to convey it then. We had mortgages and the banks weren't interested in releasing property from a mortgage when the development was just getting started. And so we waited until we'd done something about the mortgages and that was uh, about two years after we gave that lot verbally to the association that we executed that deed. So it was 1986. Thank you. Any questions from DRB members? I was just, is there any map that actually depicts lot one as a separate lot that doesn't include the reserved for common land designation? Yes, there, there. Uh, unfortunately, there are multiple maps. Okay. So I, yeah. I, I'll start, um, if I may, uh, with the first map. I don't think um, Meredith did. They get the original Terry Boyle plan that I. No. Okay. They we did have, not. I tried. I tried to avoid too much confusion in what I was presenting. Yeah. So yeah. jo Joan is quicker than I am, so she grabbed the the map. And since you asked the question, I'll give you this. Okay. Would other members like a copy of the map? We we'll just pass it around. Oh, it's all around. Thank you. 
you want to just use this one that's yeah. up here? Yeah, I'll just okay. point out quickly so people can see on the map. This is the plan that the Planning Commission approved in July and um, gave conditional approval to in February of uh, 1983. And just for clarity, this is the plan that it gave final approval to in uh, 1983. In July. Right, in July. So the lot we're talking about is identified as lot one. It's a little hard to read because that plan was sitting in my file for 36 years. <laughs> Uh, it didn't copy well, but I think if you look at it, you can see that this first one is labeled number one and that there are a total of eight houses uh, along that part of the development. And then if you flip back to the one that you were just said was the final approved one. This is the plan that the, was approved in July, uh, on July 5th, 1983, yes. And that lot one is n not depicted on that as lot a separate one lot? Is no, is a note. It says reserve lot number one. So the, res the reservation, where well, we're really getting into the weeds here, so <laughs> I'm sorry. The reservation was placed on this entire block of common land because we were, we were doing two things. We were saying we want to reserve the right uh, for lot one on this plan that got approved. And we're also telling the Planning Commission, as you'll see in the minutes that Meredith sent you, but we want to reserve the right to add two more units. We never did it, but we were, we were very concerned in the early days. Some. I see a lot of familiar faces around the uh, dais here, and uh, some of you may remember that there was a time when uh, there was a whole lot of doubt whether Murray Hill would ever come to fruition. Uh, and so we, we had shared some of that doubt. So we, uh, we included lot one, in the plan that got approved, and there's also in the minutes of the Planning Commission meeting, our reservation of the right to add up to two more units on this, what be ultimately became common land. But it, that didn't include, you said earlier that it, that lot one as it, as it's kind of depicted now, the like actual lot was approved, but it doesn't seem like that's the case. It seems like the large common, the 4.327 acre common land was lot one with the right to reserve development units for it. But the actual triangular lot that we're looking at now, it doesn't look like that was approved, at least on this map. Is that no, correct? Not back then, no. Okay. But that was approved. And then in 1997, the, uh, there was a Supreme Court decision referred to as the Bianchi case, and it required that uh, attorneys had to do a do research into whether uh, people, uh, whether the development had been received, individual homes had received a certificate of occupancy. And in order to get that, there had to be as built plans to show that the development had been built as the permit said it was to be built. Well, the city held hearings in 1997 and it adopted that plan that shows the triangular lot as the as built plan for Murray Hill. So effectively that became the plat for Murray Hill is that drawing you're looking at. Okay. <clears throat> That a copy of that it's filed as built plan is included in the staff report. And that's map C? Um, so the map C items, those are attached to my memorandum okay. about talking about how many units are approved for this area okay. of Murray Hill. Um, the map regarding the as built plans is attached to the development application, actually. So after. 
the one, two, the second half of the third sheet from the back of the application itself. And there's a nice red December 2nd, 1997 received stamp on it. Couldn't get the whole map for you on this one. Perfect. Thank you. Um, thank you for your explanation and the history. Um, it's, it was it was very clear, and I still have another question, <laughs> despite a good explanation. Um, so you shared with us the um, meeting minutes of October 1984, and um, Planning Commission member Ms. Bear asked for the condition that Lot 1 be dedicated as common land, et cetera. Um, was that to fulfill a concern? Or was that to address a concern of the Planning Commission, or was that to fulfill the applicant, your desire at that yeah. time that to our, convey? That was definitely our desire. Let, let me... Um, so it wasn't that she was putting the condition on it because she was concerned about open space or visual impact or things like that. Um, fair to say it was accommodating your request? It really was. It was totally accommodating. And even the wording of her, her motion... Um, I don't have the October planning commission. I, I can, yeah. Okay. I am definitely the paper minder in this family. <laughs> Thankless job. <laughs> she, she's just kidding you. She, she keeps poking me and telling me what to say. <laughs> so. Let, let me uh, read the, the minutes uh, of that October 10 meeting. So it's item 5 on page 4 of the minutes. And do people, do we have the extra copies? I handed them. Oh, you yeah. did? We have them Way in front of, of us. Me. So I, I okay. see the condition that it gets to on page 5, condition 3. All right. Yeah. Um, so you, you have me telling the planning commission, I think pretty much what I told you tonight, we got a permit and didn't want to use it, gave the land away. And so here's the way the motion is uh, stated. She moved for approval of the revised plot plan for Murray Hill Development Upper Main Street as requested by the developer, which will include the following, the first two don't apply to lot one, and then the third, lot number one, be dedicated as common land, with the title to this land being accepted by the Murray Hill Homeowners Association. The, the, <coughs> the reason I want to focus your attention on that is you'll notice in the minutes, the motion does not say that uh, the lot one is to be reserved for common land as the notation on the platform shows. The, the motion says that lot one be dedicated as common land with the title being accepted by the homeowners association. And the putting the words reserved for common land, as I said earlier, was after the hearing to try to comply with what the commission had approved and also to deal with the fact that we weren't going to be conveying that lot until we could pay our mortgages down, uh, use the word reserved in connection with that lot. We wanted people to understand that we were not going to build on that lot. It was not going to be ours, so we publicly stated here on what was filed that it was not going to be the developers purview to put anything on that lot. So it sounds like um, the motion addressed your request and it sounds like it also may have answered some community concerns that were being discussed at that time about whether you would develop it. That, that may not be relevant. Um, I d actually, I, it might be, I don't believe there were no comments from anybody about Lot 1. It, it was never an issue. So. Precise. Thank you. 
I have a question that raised. So when we're talking about lot one here with these minutes, are you talking about just the small triangle? Or are you talking about uh, the four we're, point, the total four point total something we're, acres? We're talking about the four point yeah. three acres of common land. So you don't think there was ever any restriction on building additional units within that four point some acres? Oh no, no, I think they anticipated that we might well come back and ask them and ask for permission to add more units. And what, what as developers, what we were doing by having that inserted in planning commission approvals was putting all of the people who would buy units at Murray Hill on notice that yes, you're buying into a development and yes, you're buying, you're driving by open land, but the developer has the legal right to come back and ask for additional units on that land. But that seems inconsistent with the way the survey was drawn up in 83 where the common land was identified on either side of the, the drive, mm -hmm. um, but the area that's marked as area number two was marked as future condominium units. So if, if the common land right behind lot two, that we'll call lot one <laughs> for these purposes, the 4.3, I mean, if that was designated as, as common land, that's normally something that's that's not to, to be developed, to be held in common and open for the development. And it <coughs> is listed differently than this other uh, area of land that you did intend and, and eventually developed into condos. I, I'm maybe not following the distinction that you're drawing. Well, well um, I, I actually, I, I'm not an attorney, but uh, I've uh, dealt with permits uh, now and again. And actually, I, um, I think that it is not uncommon for a developer to say, uh, this block of land is common land, but I'm going to reserve the right to do certain things on the common land, including creating an additional unit. But we weren't doing that. We were doing the reverse of that. We were saying, we're sitting here. We're holding a permit to build on this land, and yet we are telling you we're going to give the land to the association. But we want to reserve that right for additional units. If this development goes, looks like it's going south, we want some ability financially to raise additional money. And that placed all of the purchasers on notice. They, they had uh, copies of the permits. And the Declaration of uh, Covenants, Conditions, and Restrictions, and the bylaws that the Planning Commission had, and that which, which were given to all potential purchasers, states in there that Lot 1 is one of the units so from day one, lot one was identified as one of the units on, within the condominium documents. That lot one uh, was uh, existed for the purpose of a single family house. Uh, and it also, for the first 10 years, from 1983 to 1993, uh, the declaration contained a reservation on our part to build two, <coughs> to put two more units on the common land. So everybody was aware up front and in advance that this is designated to be designated common land, but the developer has a right to come back. And you know, I feel that old defensiveness of having to, because I used, I was the developer and I was sitting here uh, looking forward, telling you this is what we're going to do. But now I'm looking back and I'm telling you, but well, we never did any of those things. Mm -hmm. We never built an extra unit on the common land. Uh, we deeded the lot that we said we were going to deed. We deeded it to the association and they own it. And I'm only here tonight 
to you because I have some background with this development, but we have no, we get nothing out of this. This is all for the association. I hope they're lowering your dues for the next <laughs> 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 so I, I think what I'm hearing you say is that at one time it could have been your prerogative to develop that lot as the people who developed the whole of it. Yep. But by deeding it to the homeowners association, you ensured that when and if that lot was going to be developed, it would be the decision of the homeowners association and no longer of an individual landowner. Right. And Absolutely that's where we are today. Exactly we are hearing that. about the will of the homeowners association yep. to make this lot available for sale. Right. Yep. And, and in March. Thank you. Oh, sorry. More than two thirds of the owners at Murray Hill in fact voted to redesign the lot to make it more saleable and to allow um, the lot to be sold. Okay. Thanks. That's a good clarification. You, you do have the history as the individuals who, who kicked the whole project off, but you are speaking for the Homeowners Association's right. decision yep. today. Thank you. Questions? Ryan? I mean, I'm just, I guess it'd be helpful to, I don't know if you, you read through the staff report that, you know, there's a suggestion that we go through this Stowe Club Highlands analysis. And I think what you're, the start of this is that this was not a material condition necessary for the approval that this not be a lot. And I've heard you articulate why you think that is. Let's just say we say that this language here, dedicated as common land, you know, on paper anyway, seems to say that it's not going to be developed as additional units. Can you address any of those uh, other factors, changes in circumstances, changes in law, um, that might justify altering the condition, even if it were material? Um, well, I was uh, actually intending to take the Planning Commission's motion uh, and go through that with you, and, and we've already done that. Except one part of it. Except which part is that? Where we feel that the condition has been met. Yeah. The, 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 the point that we uh, hope you will agree with us on is that even assuming that that uh, permit condition had said the notation should be reserved for common land, uh, and the motion doesn't say reserve for common land, it says common land, um, that we believe that the day the deed was signed and title to that lot went from our development corporation to the association, that condition, as stated by Ms. Abair, was fulfilled, and it did not have any future role. The land was conveyed. It became common land owned by the association. The condition has no ongoing role because what the motion of approval says is that the land be, they use the term dedicated, but deeded as common land to the association. That was done. So we believe that the Stowe Club Highlands uh, test uh, doesn't apply at all because of that. But, but secondly, the the, Stowe, the Supreme Court, both in uh, Stowe Highlands and then uh, three or four more appeals by Stowe Highlands and then appeals from decisions in Pittsburgh, uh, Waitsfield, I uh, can't remember where the other one is, all that went through the Supreme Court. And the court ended up using the Act 250 test for... Um, to determine whether or not the, the condition was being changed uh, materially. And the, could you happen to have that handy, the Act 250? That's the one I'm looking for. Okay. 
Meredith probably knows right where it is. Well, the, the first part of the test, Meredith has outlined this, uh, and we're in complete agreement On page with it. 39. Are you talking about page 21 of the staff report? Well, I'm trying to find... <coughs> that is the, the that is the beginning of the test. Meredith, where are the... the are you talking page 21 of the staff report? Yeah, I think I am. Alex? Yeah. On page 21? It's... Uh, Starts at A, A through F are the uh, requirements for consideration under the Act 250 Rule 34. -E. Okay, yeah, the, the first one is if the applicant um, proposes, uh, is the test to determine whether the applicant is proposing to amend a condition that was critical to the issuance of the permit. And we're saying no. Yep, and I've understood. We've I've got your explanation for why you say that. I'm not. I'm just. I think the the language dedicated as common land generally means dedicated as common land, not for individual ownership and construction of an individual single family house on that land. The fact that it was dedicated to the homeowners association doesn't really change that. All of the common elements are generally dedicated, are generally conveyed to the homeowners association. That doesn't mean the homeowners association then has the opportunity to sell additional lots for construction. So, I, I think, I and mean, I'm not, I'm just saying, a, a reasonable person could read this condition as saying, law one needs to be common land. And what you're proposing, what the association is proposing now is something different from that. So I'd just like to have some discussion as to if we do disagree with you on that first point and say, yes, this was a condition that says keep it open as common land, whether these other factors might justify altering that condition to allow for it to be sold as a new lot. Okay. So th there, there are a couple of things that I think mitigate against that interpretation. The, the first is that you have a total of uh, over 18 acres of common land uh, at Murray Hill. And none of that says reserved for common land. But you have a lot one that uses the word reserved for common land. I think a logical interpretation of that is that there must be something special about lot one that they would reserve that at using your line of reasoning that it would something that should uh, stay attached to this piece of land I guess in perpetuity um, there must have been something special because why would they distinguish between common land identified as lot one and all of the rest of the common land because the way these associations are set up and we used when we created uh, the when we did the original drafting and then turned them over to our attorney to uh, put them into legal language um, the system that's set up is that when you create a homeowners association you establish what its powers <clears throat> are and included in the powers of an association is very good i can't speak for all of them so boy a lot of them that i dealt with over the years uh, are identical to murray hill in that the association all of the individual owners voting as a, an association have the authority to change the declaration and the bylaws, including buying additional land or creating additional units if 
they choose to do that. The Murray Hill Association, the, their uh, declaration and bylaws say it takes, um, I rounded off, 67% of the owners have to agree to the change in the declaration and bylaws or you can't go forward with whatever you're proposing. In this case, the owners were all informed that the board of directors had decided that it wanted to amend the declaration and bylaws to allow the uh, changing of the boundaries of lot one and for it to be sold as a uh, for a dwelling. <clears throat> The vote was 60 to 1. The total, so we didn't get full vote from all the owners. We uh, never do. Uh, we ended up uh, 24 votes shy of total. But the 60 to 1, the, the minimum we were required to get was 57% of the owners. 67. 67? Okay, I stand corrected. 67% of the owners and, um, no, I'm sorry, the, the, that's right. We had to get 67% of the ownership, which meant 57 of the 85 family owners had to vote in favor and 60 out of 61 voted in favor. So I believe that what was done in setting this up and the recent vote by the association, all of this is entirely consistent with the way uh, association, homeowners associations have typically been set up in Vermont. I can I just add one thing to that? Um, because I don't want to leave people with a perception that because something is labeled common land, it only has one use. In fact, the association, through that two-thirds vote, can change the use of the common land. So that, that gives them the authority. They have to do what we're doing tonight and come before you all for a permit to do something different. But in fact, they can do that through their sure. own declaration. I mean, and that's the key. This this process deals only with whether or not it complies with the conditions. Obviously, if there was no conditions at all as regarding, if there's nothing that said common land anywhere, then the association would be free to apply for whatever permits. But here, there's a condition that says reserved for common land, and it's our job to just decide whether or not that condition means anything, whether it's enforceable, and if it does, what it means. So right. the fact that the Homeowners Association voted in favor of it, I mean, that's great, um, but that doesn't really answer the question as to the legal authority to alter a condition of a subdivision approval. Right. And we would argue the condition was met when the land was deeded to the association and became common land. So, but then why did they include the language dedicated as common land? If that condition only required it to be dedicated, to be conveyed to the association, why did it say as common land? Because they, the association owns everything in common. That There's no other thing, label you could put on a piece of land that the association would own. It could have, I mean, it, except that you're now saying it's a it's a deedable lot that's not common land. What it is owned in common by the association. That's what the common land is. It's just like the sewer system, the water system, it's all owned in common. It's one of the common elements. Uh, I would like to draw a distinction between the language in the minutes and the language that's used on the final plan. <clears throat> the language in the minute says, Lot 1 be dedicated as common land. I, dedicated carries the force of um, permanence, in my mind. I mean, I re think of it that way. Um, I think we also may be confusing common land with open land, that, or undeveloped land, or undevelopable, or held in perpetuity as um, 
open land. Um, and so I'm just urging us to, in our own characterization of uh, our own interpretation, but also somehow dedicated as common land was transposed by the time the final map came out and the, the, the annotation is reserved for common land. And reserved carries less force to me than dedicated. Uh, it's reserved for common land. Uh, you reserve your rights. I mean, a reservation of rights is the opportunity to perhaps identify a different use down in the road. Now, uh, uh, certainly the permitting process in 1984 wasn't as fine-tuned as it is now. And so we take language from these minutes dedicated as common land, and it ends up on the plan as reserved for common land. Um, I, I think it's clear that that it was anticipated the title would be conveyed to the homeowners association, and and that the homeowners association would hold it as common land the way Mrs. Senegal was just explaining that all those other elements that the homeowners association has title to are common elements. It's either common land or it's a common system or the, um, the tennis courts are, it's, that's a common element, although it's, it's an improved element, it's still, it's not, it doesn't say open. Yeah. Okay, that's, I, I guess that's the distinction I'm trying to draw. So. Um, but I think what they're proposing is is to make this, to expand Lot 1. And so the reserve for common land that's specific to that little triangle doesn't apply to the remainder of the 4.041 acres, which just says common land on the plat. Yes. And that if this were to proceed, it would require putting some portion of that common land, mm -hmm. the 4.041 acres, into Lot 1 and then selling it for private ownership, which is not common land so if that is a would no would no longer be common land correct the proceeds would be a common <laughs> asset right but the, the within the realm of our purview and subdivision approval looking at the use of the land the land would no longer be used as common land it would be until the deed was signed <laughs> right Kate? I, think, I think this is an important inquiry and we do need to have a lot of respect for past permit conditions so so to dig around in this is is useful one um, question I might have of some of you who have served on the board longer than I have is how often do you encounter these kind of um, you know this this may be perhaps an example of uh, imprecise language or clumsy language or maybe some wires crossed um, in the effort to uh, codify the intentions of the applicant and the intentions of the planning commission. Could this be a case where we're, we're looking at, does that happen sometimes where you just end up with funny words and the intention is clear beyond the words or do you go straight to the, straight with the print? How, how, how has this, this is, this is body? totally unique. I have never seen anything oh, exactly great. like okay. this. It okay. goes, it goes back to the days <clears throat> when Mr. Blakeman was chairman of the right. Planning Commission and I came on two years after that event, but it it would seem to me that um, we didn't. If I had this Bible to work with, back then it would be. A, there is impreciseness in probably all of the work that was done by the Planning Commission. We didn't have a DRB then. We had right. a Planning Commission. Right. So I. Uh, I think that uh, that's probably where we're at in terms of way back when. Okay, thanks. I'm just trying to reconcile language with circumstance and, you know. How do the members feel about the annotation on lot one that reads reserved for, is it reserved for? Reserved yes. as? For. Reserved for. Reserved for common land. Do you, do the, do the members view that as a permit condition? Well, it's not just that. It's also the language common land and the remainder of the lot surrounding that. Because if, if the boundary line adjustment is granted to include that additional triangle. I, I, we didn't get to adjustment of this lot yet. 
Okay, well really. then, okay. And there aren't I, I any just, conditions about that remaining common land, just about other lot than one. there's the notation. No, I mean, lot. I, 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 I guess in reading lot. both the '84 approval and this, I, they seem to be imprecise restatements of each other, um, and so it's it, it really goes back to the first question. I, I actually had a question, Meredith. I don't know if anyone has done this um, as far as a calculation for the total taking the whole Murray Hill um, mm -hmm. area and doing a density calculation. Is this anything that's offensive? If we assume, obviously these are in different ownerships now, these lots, but is the total, um, is the total number of, of units and the total acreage, can it sustain these additional developments? See, so currently, because we're talking about amending this plat, um, it's being amended under the old rules. Okay. So we have the density analysis under the current rules has not been done because technically it doesn't, doesn't apply. apply. Okay. What about um, and under the old under the old rules, it's laid out in the memo that I attached <clears throat> in considering whether or not they actually have room for additional units. Um, because they have, s since they got their original approval, they have added additional land. Mm -hmm. um, this new lot will not violate those old density requirements. Okay. I mean, I, I, that's, the, just the, that's the short answer. Well, I think that strikes me as w w the salient point here, which is, you know, regardless of whether we get wrapped up in a Stoke Club's Highlands test, something has changed, which is that there's more land here than was initially on the table. So even under the old rules, and presuming that for no other purpose <coughs> that, you know, one of the big reasons why common land is often reserved as open is because of density requirements. That land is tied up in the zoning. You put units, more units closer together and you tie up a certain amount of common land that's that's tied to the the other lots that are sold and, and here you know it's not offensive to that to have this additional lot carved out so i think that under that does two things one is it changes if we go through a stoke club highlands analysis it's factual change that wasn't there when this initial permit was granted and this initial condition even if interpreted in the most restrictive manner Second, it does go to, I think, your point, Ken, earlier about, um, you know, whether this was um, uh, an important condition or a, an essential condition um, because it does, um, it does allow for this additional development. So, I mean, I think that in some ways opens this. I had another sort of procedural point. Is this that we're we're on sketch plan, right? So we're this not, is sketch plan. We're not coming to a final decision tonight. We're just simply going to give them feedback as to whether, if they if they apply. Yep, okay. if they apply, and also whether or not you need more information to make this decision. Mm -hmm. I, I I mean, this is a little bit of a historic chase, which is why they brought out the uh, the tried and tra tested team. <laughs> um, but uh, you know, it just it, it strikes me that if, if for no other reason that there doesn't seem to be the same pressure on the development of the entire parcel that there once was um, in this in this development that would allow this additional lot. And as far as you know, that would lead me to at least conclude that if this was granted, it would be granted under that type of analysis, which is. You know these these lots all come from this common source, and for the purposes of zoning in this common plan, you know one or two lots are possible, but it may be something I don't know if the board <coughs> has considered as to the size of the lots or done their own density calculations or agree with Meredith's density calculations. At least if I, I presume you're selling this one lot, you know not because you're planning on putting a water slide in the pool, but for other more um, important financial reasons, which may come up again. And if you cut yourself off at the knees by creating one lot that doesn't allow you to create another lot down the road, or your children, your children's children to create that other lot, um, you know, that, that would be an important consideration. Is yeah. that, is this a sensible lot, one, to raise the money that you wish to raise now, but two, given this calculation does this 
does this change future considerations? Um, I, you know, I, I can feel the um, board of directors sitting behind me um, as I prepare to make this statement, but you know, that this lady and I are the ones who said, we don't want to build on lot one. We want to give it away mm -hmm. uh, instead. And quite frankly, our assumption was it would never get built on if we gave it to the association. But we always told the association that this lot is yours as a nest egg, and if you ever get into a financial situation where you want to raise money, you can sell that. You can go back and get your permits reinstated because we reserved all of the rights all the way along so that you will be able to get permits to uh, be able to sell a building lot. But my feelings about uh, building more units at Murray Hill haven't changed. I mean, we added uh, 14 acres of land to the original Murray Hill that allowed 85 units, and we added one unit for the 14 acres. Well, even if a lot of that is in what used to be called medium density, which is four units, 4.33 units per acre. Um, but even if we assume it was one acre zoning as low density used to be, that would have allowed 14 more units on that land. We didn't do the 14 units because we have always had a vision of Murray Hill as being a place where mm -hmm. there's lots of open space and there's lots of undeveloped woodland and you, you fit the units in. Now, people like Jack Lindley will, and uh, Bill will tell you that Boy, in the early days, uh, people who lived downtown and looked up and saw the buildings uh, appearing to be on the skyline uh, were not happy with Murray Hill. And they, uh, but in general, Murray Hill has been successful because we've been, we've had the open land, we've had lots of woodland, and now that the Vegetation is taken control. We don't have the view issues from downtown Montpelier that we once had. Uh, but I would, I would be uh, personally. Not I can't speak for the homeowners association, but personally, I would be happy to see this association amend its declaration to put Murray Hill under the new common interest ownership statute for Vermont, which requires 100% of the unit owners to agree to the creation of an additional unit. So as close as you can get to be creating an impossible situation, I think, is to say that 100% of the owners. So we haven't really changed our belief. We want to see, we're, we're leaving the scenes now, but we'd like to see Murray Hill preserved essentially as it is into the future. And uh, we have, um, if we owned lot one, we wouldn't build on it. But we don't own it. An association has owned it for 33 years, 30 some years. And they have always had, believed they had the right to sell this as a building lot. And they clearly have the legal right to amend their declaration and bylaws so that if you were to say, <clears throat> I don't believe you're going to say this, but if you were to say that there is something special about lot one and, and that it would have had to come from me because nobody else commented at that October meeting. It all came from me. And I was saying, we don't want to build on lot one. Um, but if there's something special about lot one that warranted reserving it as open land, which it isn't, it's common land, well then, literally, we could 
create, the association could create another building lot immediately adjacent to lot one, but on the common land, and it would be perfectly okay. It would pass muster that way because there is no prohibition against units on the rest of the common land. Only a quarter of an acre has that prohibition or has that hmm. notation label on it. So can I ask a question? Um, I, I think we don't want to, if you can avoid it, create an absurd outcome such as the association feeling that it needs to create a lot on something that doesn't have the reserve tag on it. Um, when it when we believe it, it's really clear they have okay. the right to amend their declaration and they've done so. Thank you, Ken. Roger. I just have one question. You may have answered this before, but um, how did uh, lot one go from being a, tri a rectangle to being a triangle? Um, I cannot find any record of how that occurred. Uh, I can make an educated guess. I think... Roger, you're talking about this... Yeah, I'm talking about this, 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 this map is a triangle. <clears throat> And then on subsequent maps and, and the proposal before us, the application before us as it has a triangle. I, I, yeah. Roger, I, I can answer that question, on, on, not from factual basis, but this is a this is almost a sketch plan. As you see yeah. the, the, uh -huh. the rectangles. Yeah. The rectangles were served by um, parking areas that were off the main the highways, the, uh -huh. the roadways. Yeah. So it's it an entirely different scheme. It was a highly, highly different subdivision scheme. We're, we're not even certain those are single family homes, although they are more likely to be. But the, the scheme just changed. And that city side, that city side drive, it, it changed the density and, and like. I mean, it, I'm sure the, the developer just did it on their own initiative. You know, I, I think it was, I'm trying to even I guess, recall. excuse me, it, yeah. it, it, it predates, predates the design. permit. Yeah. Okay, it, it, we have to assume that the That's design right. was, was accomplished by the applicant or in some, uh, who knows whose brainstorm it was, but by the time the approval came forward, it involved different shape, con di differently configured lots. Um, it looks to me as though when the surveyor drew it on, and, and I have to tell you, there was so much going on that was terrifyingly scary <laughs> when we were doing this. I think I was 39 when I, we started, and Ken was 41, and we had three children. And we didn't know what the hell we were doing, frankly, and we were terrified. So. What that lot was designed as by our surveyor at the time, we <clears> probably <throat> didn't pay any attention to it. He made a nice straight line there, and that's probably where it came from. Thank you. Does, does anyone on the board question whether lot one exists as a subdivided lot? No. Yeah. Okay. Solomon, yeah. So, d does anyone? W what's the view of the board members as to whether the language on the subdivision plat that says <coughs> lot one, this is map C, lot one of very small letters, numbers, whatever that size is. Um, reserved for common land. Um, does anyone view that as a permit condition that was imposed by the Planning Commission? I mean, I think in light of the minutes where they, the motion for approval of that plat says, I'm going to include this condition that says lot one be dedicated as common land as a condition of approval. Uh, I, I, 
I don't know that it really matters because I think I'm with Dan and this is what I was trying to get to a little bit was that, you know, this was a long time ago. You've added land. The regulations have changed. You're now looking for an amendment under our new set of regulations. I think if you get to the second step of Stoke Club Highlands, there's a lot of reasons to say flexibility is warranted here, especially in light of the ambiguity as to what the intent behind this was. But in looking at the language of the minutes, it seems like you said it was never their intent to put any houses in this area. As a result, they put a condition saying we're going to dedicate this as common land. And I think just looking at these minutes alone without your extremely detailed recollection and explanation of it, um, a regulator could conclude that there is, in fact, a permit condition on lot one. So I would say that. Um, I would also say that in applying to, to view that permit condition is requiring it to be remain common land in perpetuity to run with the land that's what permit conditions do yep unless they're amended subsequently and, and common land is open and undeveloped land I think that that's a reasonable interpretation given the nature of this PUD that existed <coughs> well would you then say you can put since you said you added land to, so there's 14 more units carving up the whole other and adding 14 lots in the common land is there nothing in this approved plat that would prevent that I, that's conjectural. I, right. I, so, but I'm, we're talking about interpreting the. So, I, 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 yeah. Uh, let's see. I, I guess I, I have a couple of things I'd like to point out. Um, <clears throat> when you read, um, so, so the motion starts out that. Can I? Uh, I'm sorry, <clears throat> but we've been doing this for an hour and fifteen minutes already. So we don't have to. I, I the. the the words are on the page yeah. from October 4th, 1984. Um, especially since this is only sketch plan, we don't have to come to a decision tonight. Can I just um, add one little sure. point? Just a reminder that under the rules when this was created, there was no minimum open space requirement. The the Planning Commission had to consider that factor about how much open space was there, but there was no minimum requirement. So the, the, the common land designation doesn't necessarily mean it has to be open space, is my reading of the way the, the regs worked. Was there any land that was designated as open space as opposed to common land? No. 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 So then, no. If, I mean, if you say that common land doesn't necessarily mean open space, there is no open space, therefore you can develop the common land, I think undermines everything about how a PUD works. But there was a density requirement as to how many units they were allowed, and they were, they were took, their, their max units were presented, mm -hmm. and they have built that max number of units for the original acreage and then they added some acreage. So, you know, they, they still have a minimum, there's still a minimum number of, of units allowed. Yeah, no, I'm sorry. Not you know, they could, they could, it's, I mean, that all so it leaves, it leaves you with an open space left over. Yeah, and I think all that warrants saying that, yeah. uh, if this, this condition, condition three of the approval, there's a lot of good reasons to amend it and mm -hmm. to allow for it to, to, to essentially get rid of the condition. Yep, I, I wouldn't I, say that there isn't a condition in the first instance. It's just how I would agreed. read Agreed. I, I do, I do um, want, want to comment. I, I appreciate your uh, seeing flexibility if we get into the Stowe Highlands test. Um, but um, I, I can't agree with you that common land is meant to be something that is kept in perpetuity. Um, we're operating under state law, which does not use the term common land. It talks about common, land, common elements, as the chairman pointed out. And land is one of those elements. It also talks about the uh, association that owns the common elements having the, the criteria that determine when it's allowed to change 
Right. The the common the. Um, no, I, I understand. Common, All uh, that's governed by you know, Common Ownership Interests Act, the former so, uh, Condominium Act. It's but this is we're just talking about a zoning question. Whether this actual these approvals create a zoning condition, and the the rights of a homeowners association to govern itself aren't really relevant to that. But uh, in I don't I'm not I'm okay. not looking for further discussion on this point. Okay. I mean, are you free to talk? But I don't. No, no, I'm, I'm fine. I'll just want to pipe in at this member. Um, I see, uh, I see enough of a difference between the common land as it pertains to the Murray Hill uh, Association uh, as being separate and distinct from the Lot One common land, which clearly has a unique designation, regardless of how it got there. But Given the time that has expired between 1983 and today in 2018, I, I just could not, in good conscience, try to treat that one lot in the same fashion as I would want to treat the open space common land in the meadow in that, uh, the other aspects of that may, may attach to that. Thank you, Kevin. The, um, does the, how does the board feel about <clears throat> whether the lot one notation constitutes an issue critical to the issuance of the permit. Well, it's, it's an element of how, of how we're charged to. If the applicant does not propose to amend a permit condition that was included to resolve an issue critical to the issuance of the permit, uh, DRB inquiry under the rule ends and it may consider the amendment application on its merits. It's the if I was not, if, if the original applicant was not sitting before us, here's how I would think through that. I would say, would the applicant have accepted the decision of the Planning Commission in the absence of Condition 3? I speculate that the person would have. So. I mean, that was the expressed. Condition three was something that the applicant desired to have at that time. It seems likely that the applicant would not have walked away from the project had condition three not been included. So I see it as being something, as we've heard, and as we've seen in the minutes, that is of importance to the applicant, but that was not a make or break. Well, I think it's but critical it's it, to the. I was going to say, it's, I think it's from the perspective of the regulatory authority. Mm -hmm. In other words, would the. Montpelier Planning Commission have was the fact that lot one was to be conveyed to the homeowners association for let, let's use the language for use as common land rather than reserved or dedicated for uses was that a critical element of the subdivision permit that issued at that time I guess we don't know that because what we've I, heard is that it was included at the request of the applicant, not because Cor of the desire of the planning commissioner. Exactly. Dan? Well, I was just going to point out, though, that the fact is is that it's it's there in the decision. Um, and I, I'm a little bit reluctant, uh, although we've heard a great deal of testimony, um, to make central conditions of a, of a permit. Um, not a determination that they are not uh, critical to the issuance of the permit um, without further documentation within the permit mm -hmm. itself. Um, the one language in the grant that I think does go towards that point is the fact that, um, sorry, let me just find the, it says at the, at the, I mean, the, the language where it says that Mrs. A, Ms. Hebert moved for the approval um, as requested by the developer, um, but then it says which will include the following. Um, and those are each essential conditions. Uh, yeah, it doesn't say that the conditions were at the request of the developer. It says the approved revised plot plan was at the request of the developer, and then including the following. I don't know, it's ambiguous. 
Yeah, I, I think it is because if you if, how, there are, how many lots? 46? 48. 48. So um, did the Planning Commission approve a 48 lot subdivision only if lot one wasn't going to, was going to be held as common land? That, that would be a 47 lot subdivision, would it? Would it not? I, I think I think the Planning Commission approved a 48-lot subdivision and included that caveat as to lot one on the basis of the representation made by the applicant. I don't think the intent of the Planning Commission was to approve a 47-lot. It wasn't critical to the issuance of the permit that there only be 47 saleable lots, 47 developable lots. We're in sketch plan. We're in sketch plan. <clears throat> because we have to go through the entire subdivision process to amend the plat. So we're in sketch plan. This is a time when we hug all the lawyers around the table up here. <laughs> we come back to common sense. Wait. Well, I, 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 and we realize what we're attempting to do within the strikes of the new language here and the direction creating. He, Here's my thing. I find nothing that says that 48 units weren't approved by the Planning Commission. I, I don't disagree with you, Jack. I, I think it's just a matter, I, I think at this point, at least from my perspective, it's a matter of what course the car takes to get to the destination. I think the uh, and, applicant and is going to have to decide what course they want to take. Well, no, but I mean, as far as us as a... Uh, Development Review Board reviewing this, I mean, I think the the outcome is, I, at least as far as I can tell from the testimony that's been presented, I, I think there's enough evidence to meet a Stoke Club Highlands test because of the change in circumstances. So, you know, that's the onerous test. If we avoid that test and we say this is not an essential uh, condition, um, you know, I, I, I can certainly see, and I think the chair is is making that point as to whether or not it was an essential condition, and that ties together with the testimony that we've heard tonight, and the, of which, you know, I think is a, is certainly a valid route. Um, but if we did have to go all the way down Stowe Club Highlands Drive, um, there is the there is the evidence to support that as well. Um, so, and I think to a certain extent we have to. We have to consider that, and we should consider that, because they're talking about a new lot. Don't forget, we're talking about lot one that's been reserved, but we're also talking about changing lot one as they've they've applied, because it went from a triangular-shaped piece of 0.265 to now a, a larger, more rectangular piece. And, and I, you know, I, I have no problem with that, um, for the same reasons of common sense that you're talking about, Jack, of trying to create um, a saleable lot that, that, that is reasonable and will likely yield money, given this is maybe their one shot, or at least it's their first shot and whenever the last lot was sold um, from the common de development, um, let's, let's look at this right let's, and let's do it right. Yeah, uh, I, I think the common land... <coughs> given the fact that it's a quarter of an acre that they're taking out of that four acre parcel, it's a minimal land <coughs> for anybody that's worried about the birds no, I, 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 and I the understand. raptors that are probably in that field, I think they're well protected. No, I, I, I'm sure they are. But the, the other point is, is that, you know, you create these, I mean, that's, that's I think, what, what really lies at the heart of both Stowe Club Highlands and our role here today, which is, you know, you create these these planned unit developments or subdivisions um, because, and there's some thought that's put into the creation of them. And there's always going to be pressure years down the road to squeeze one more lot in or to put one more thing in. Um, and, and that's often not the intention of the original developers or the original regulatory board. And to you know, to, to have this as a sort of creeping scale over time, I think does discredit to the idea of so these regulatory stops because no means not now. And 
I don't think that serves good planning purposes, and I don't think that serves the the landowners' um, correctly, purposes. We only have one other PUD in Montpelier, and that's the college. Is that correct? Is there another PUD anywhere? There was on Upper Main at uh, 250 Main Street. Was the PUD? I think that's right. It's an AI PUD. Oh, right. So that it's not it's not something that's we have the great opportunity to be messing with PUDs the rest sure. of our lives. Hey, who knows if we'll get more? <clears throat> oh. Meredith, can you give us a, uh, um, some direction? Well, I, I unfortunately I think that Dan has has summarized the issue in that. The, the board has to decide, and it, it wasn't something that I could make that decision as to whether or not you're going to go down the path of saying Stowe Club Highlands test doesn't apply here, in which case you just review the application under the city's um, subdivision and PUD approval process, focusing just on this lot, not the whole picture. Or if you also have to do the Stowe Club Highlands test, it's, you know, and it's not something where I could find facts other than the change in facts with the additional land that we're really pulling in to, to meet the Stowe Club Highlands test. Um, you know, if it, if it came to reviewing this under just the subdivision PUD approval process, I didn't really see any issues. It's the way you get there mm -hmm. that is the question. And it's it's a setting precedent and how conservative of an approach you want to take. I, I'm sorry, I don't have more direction for but you no, than I'm that. Sure. <laughs> I wish I did. I wish I could say, do it this way. <laughs> um, we have before us the minutes where the motion was made. The motion was yep. recorded in the minutes. Is there a separate permit that would, I mean, the permit, I assume, would be this. No. Okay. It's, I assume it would be the uh, same if, anyway. If you want, I can pull. I mean, because this was what you're seeing for those minutes. That was an amendment to the plat that was originally recorded with the subdivision. I mean, and you have to remember that right, the subdivision rules were like three pages right, right. at the time. Right, so the first plot was 1983, and then the second one was 1984 with the creation of Lot 1. I, I do have a copy of the actual permit form, if you'd like that. Uh, the, the application form, not so much as the permit issued. Oh, yeah. Is that that is the, is minutes, the minutes serve as the written decision. Well, I wasn't sure Here, if there I'll would be a separate it. one as there is now. No, uh, I mean, oh, thank if you, this is a little different, but I appreciate it. That's impressive. It, I mean, if I'll if you want, I can get you everything we have in the file on all the different permit versions and all the different approvals. I was trying to oh. focus on the ones that seemed applicable to this situation. I, I trust you've done a good staff review of that, and I don't want to send you on a um, <laughs> wild goose chase. Um, I was just wondering if there could be more to be learned, then I would love to know it. But if there isn't, then we'll stop right there with my question. Yeah. I, I mean, I suspect this is back in slightly less formal days. Um, they didn't know what they were doing, and we didn't know what we were yeah, doing. Yeah, at that, so at that I mean, time, this was the permit. It's also right. the permit, so yeah. you weren't kidding. Yeah, <laughs> no, no it, it's assigned. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's actually what a lot of towns still use. Thank you. Sorry about that. <laughs> and, and that's one reason that they had the whole process with Bianchi and going, okay, let's actually find out what the plat I mean, the plat is basically the recorded permit in, in essence because they, they didn't have things that were recorded and they had skipped things, so they had to go back and make sure that the final plat was recorded to show what was approved and it ended up being as built was what was approved. Great. That, that satisfies my curiosity. Thank you. Can I belabor this issue just, just for a second? I won't drag it out. I have, I have a question to ask of Meredith. Okay. Am I correct in understanding that in the um, zone, where the district that we're in now, um, that if you did a PUD today, the common land requirement would be 400 square feet per unit? Oh. 
Okay. Well, she's looking that up, so I don't waste your time. <laughs> I I can I can I, actually, I can do I can do I could come back to the board with a current analysis under the current rules if you want. <coughs> um, it would need to be an analysis of if this were PUD were created today. Because I, we don't have a section in here for right. amending. That's one of the things that needs to get fixed in these rules. I, uh, I would not favor that only because I think that invites a whole cartload of speculation. Agreed. And yeah. That's one reason we didn't yeah. do it to begin with. Yeah. No. So you I don't think. want me to tell you that I figured out that there would be 1,570 allowable units at Murray Hill <laughs> if you based it on the number of the square footage in common land that we I, have. I, I don't. I don't want those kind of things. <laughs> so I won't yeah. tell you that. Okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I think I agree with the chair. I'm not sure. <laughs> uh, that's why I was asking uh, Meredith for some some direction. Uh, I, the, if we, I could go either way on the Stoke Club Highlands analysis. Um, in, to my mind, I could conclude that that. The annotation about lot one was not a permit condition so much as it was an accommodation of a representation made by the applicant mm -hmm. at the time and that whether it was a 47 or a 48 lot subdivision was not a critical element of that permit on the other hand um, you know we have the advice of, uh, of the city's council that um, recommends a conservative approach and that we go through the Stowe Club Highlands analysis well there's no doubt in my mind where my where the all this analysis will lead me, and so I, I guess I'm asking how other board members feel. Do you, do we want to go through the Stow Club Highlands? On on this is this kind of is this question of such a moment that we do that? Um, if we feel that way, then we should, and we'll go through it, and then take the subdivision merits of the new subdivision under consideration in accordance with the new ordinance or can we conclude that it wasn't critical and that an amendment is appropriate well, let, uh, is let, it me that ask, let me ask a, a process question I mean if we we don't have to decide that tonight we're gonna kick it down the road <laughs> well no I mean it's a sketch plan I no mean, I know I understand um, I but mean, but it, 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 let me just interrupt because I'd already been. That's why I asked Meredith earlier. If it is sketch plan, uh, sketch plan would be of little utility if we didn't determine what we would do the next time we gathered. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Well, that. Uh, well, I, I I wanted to make sure you weren't um, going down because uh, I think either way we have to come. We'd have they have to come back. They have to come back have and, come back and, and have them come knowing back if they have to deal with Stowe Club Highlands when they come back and, and, and is and a, a good thing. Right. And the, or not. And the question is... <laughs> whether or not. Either way. Whether or not, whether or not they have to deal with it. And one other point, just to point out, to <clears throat> remind people that, yes, the city's attorneys did suggest going the Stowe Club Highlands route um, as the conservative approach. They acknowledged, and I talked to two different attorneys about this, that none of the Vermont case law has dealt with a Stowe Club Highlands test where the city ordinance in question or city regulations in question have a process for amending a PUD plat, whereas Montpelier's do. So you have a couple of different elements, elements that point towards not necessarily having to go through that entire analysis, both the fact potentially this might not have been an issue critical to the issuance of the permit and that Montpelier does also have those well, regulations. It, it, it's, it, it's it suggests in, in some ways that, you know, I, I, I mean, I think of the two big tests about zoning changes, which are the Stoke Up Highlands analysis and then the successive application doctrine yep. um, being high and low. And what this suggests is that there's a middle <coughs> 
ground where um, you know there is some scrutiny um, there is some search for change circumstances um, and so some of the and in a case like this where there is no clear identified purpose for this condition it's, it's not as if it was dedicated for open land it was dedicated for common land but it's clear that common land may have meant open land in some in some cases and and meant common land to be developed later in other situations so given that ambiguity I, I tend to think that there would be benefit to having um, a Stowe Club Highlands like analysis mm -hmm. given the fact that they are free to apply. I mean, that's the, that's the one thing about Stowe Club Highlands is you're not free to reapply, uh, I mean, free to amend your Act 250 permit. It's permanent, as Ryan was saying earlier, but here we have a process that does suggest that, so it suggests a lighter application of that. And given the information that we've received tonight, I, I see no, I don't see any, any roadblocks towards the applicant fulfilling that, that hurdle. But I think we, we give it a certain amount of, of precision in compliance, not only with the legal advice we were given, but I think also to give clarity to this subdivision in the future. Yep. When they don't have the, the A team to come forward and talk about what happened before. I think the question is whether they need to come forward with evidence at this final subdivision regarding the, the factors, the flexibility versus finality factors. And I guess I'll just say my own thinking. I think I would say that it, it is a condition of the approval, but I do, I think that after our discussion that I'm inclined to say that it was not a critical condition given the representations by the applicants, the original applicants as to what was intended at that hearing and some corroboration of that within the minutes that this was something suggested by the developers and therefore was not likely something that was critical to the uh, Planning Commission's approval. However, I think in most instances, the inclusion of a condition by the regulators uh, generally is something that is critical to the to the issuance of a permit. I don't think regulatory bodies generally impose conditions uh, that they that don't mean anything or that aren't uh, that don't serve any function, which is essentially what I see this as, but I think I, I I've been persuaded that that is the case here, that this common land was not intended as any sort of restriction on the, the use of lot one. So I would say that we do not need to balance the factors of finality versus flexibility at the final subdivision hearing. Well, now that that's cleared, <laughs> <laughs> what's the, uh, how does the board want to, do we want to proceed through the Stoke Club Highlands analysis? Uh, certainly not tonight. No. It, we need to set the table for our next okay. meeting. We need to give the applicant clear direction about what, how to prepare for the hearing. Is there? A, does the board want to make a decision about the Stow Club's Highland Stow Club Highlands um, <clears throat> analysis? We want to do it on a voice on a on a vote. Yeah, let's vote. Yeah. As, so as to whether or not it will be applied in the at the final review. Yes. Okay. Well, I'll make a motion. Um, motions always have to be in the affirmative. Yes. Um, I move that uh, this application be uh, put through the uh, Stow Club. Highlands um, test. I'll second. So the motion by Roger is second by Kevin. Is there a discussion? I'm going to vote against the motion because I believe that this is unique and of, of such a minor consequence for the uh, development and with the passage of time I just see no purpose at all being served by going through that analysis. Okay, L let me ask a question. 
if the motion doesn't carry and we'll, we won't apply the Stoke Club Highlands analysis, do, are, we real, are we clear about what we're going to do the next time we are here? Well, let me I believe so. Maybe articulate that into words as I understand it is that if the Stoke Club Highlands analysis is not applied next time, and, and given sketch plan, I mean, this is really our take in, in slightly more formal version, but it would essentially be our our understanding at this point in time that this was not an essential yes. condition of the permit um, and then therefore it would be reviewed under a normal um, amendment to the um, to to the original PUD 84 plan. PUD app permit that was <laughs> that's what I was so that's what I expected but I wanted to make sure that we knew what we faced Kate right Clarity is appreciated. Thank you, Dan. Um, that means that it will still be evaluated with respect to criteria about the suitability of the amendment. Okay, so we are, all right, that's the clarity that I wish to provide. There are still criteria that are met. It's not just once we don't do Stow Club or do do Stow Club, it's done. Okay, thank you. Right, let's just revisit this. The motion was, the Roger's motion was to apply the Stowe Club Highlands analysis to this application. That's correct. Correct. Okay. Any further discussion? All those in favor of the motion, please signify by raising their right hands. All those opposed? Thank you. Thank you. So, what we will do is the prism through which the lens through which we're going to review this at the at the final review is under the zoning ordinance under our subdivision regulations that are in existence right now. Thank you. Thank you. I, I'm Thank you. sorry. No, that's. Uh, you can. You're free to speak if you. Do you I've been waiting for the opportunity for someone. To I understand. Um, this was technically a procedural matter, as so far as the board's perspective. Um, you're free to speak. Please step forward. State your name. things because I'm in a unique position. I live at Lot 2. So that's been a matter of some discussion for a number of years, but I think the board should be aware of that lot is, it has a drainage ditch on it, it has a utility function on it, that's the little triangle we're talking about, not the expanded lot. But more importantly, it has it's very close to my border, and the reason that matters is it's so close that the property line boundary is in the middle of my driveway. So, 1985 or so, a deeded easement was granted so that there could be a driveway on that house when it was built. So it's a 25-foot easement across the front of Lot 1, which is my driveway. So, obviously, I have some concerns about that, and putting a house on that lot that close to my house has a really detrimental impact on the value of my property, in my estimation. Personally, I don't know that the lot one is required, the money is required, but that's, I'm not concerned with that. That's their business. But it seems to me that if the borders are all fungible right now, and that's what it seems like, we can expand into the land, we can do whatever we want, it would seem to me to make sense to swing that border out of my driveway and leave that little strip of common land where the drainage swale is and my easement is and put that lot in a clear 
free frontage. Uh, it's, it's a matter of swinging it down 25 or 30 feet down the road and making a square that would be, I think, more saleable than having creating a new lot with a easement across it right off the bat. I foresee issues with whoever lives in that house dealing with that driveway when there's a house right next to them and there's an easement as to whose land this is and where the border is. It's been a problem in the past, I suspect it will be in the future. So I would consider the topography of that little triangle of land, that quarter of an acre, and say, well, if we're going to change all the borders, because if you're going to grant making it into a big rectangle, and apparently if you're free to take that common land, why not just slide the whole thing over, leave the drainage swale where it is, leave the utility pole where it is, and leave the easement where it is, and leave that easement on common land. Mr. Roy, I, I don't mean to interrupt, but you, you've been here since the beginning, and you've, you haven't heard us discuss any of the merits of this, the subdivision application, the, where the acreage is coming from. You can, you can tell us in great detail where the location of your driveway is and the easement swale and, 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 or the drainage swale and the like. It could be in um, Enosburg Falls, for all I know, because we haven't looked at the... The, the, at this site and the configuration of lot one vis-a-vis -vis lot two, we're, we have we didn't really enter the merits of the subdivision okay, I, application. I just so wanted to be sure that it seemed like we were just sort of going down the road with check, 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 done. So I just wanted to make sure no, that, this is, that we're actually going to look at it and and consider that point. I mean, to me, it's no one else in Murray Hill is affected. The only person that's affected <laughs> is me. I, I understand. And the number one, the only vote that was against it was me. So well, it's, there you are. Thank no, you. I, I understand. And, and I hope you understand that we're going to get to the merits of the subdivision itself at the next hearing. Okay. So. Mr. Chair, are you saying that those are the types of factors we'll consider when we do our next level of review at the next meeting? Well, it's the merits of a, of a specific subdivision and a reconfiguration of the lot lines. And yep. we would always take into consideration elements impact on the adjoining properties, mm -hmm. whether there's uh, the transportation patterns or make sense the, uh, where the driveway will enter the, the street. Great. I just and wanted to make sure that was clear to our site distances and the like. Audience. Yes. So is this my only chance to talk at this meeting? Oh, I yes. wasn't sure if it was like winding down or not because I haven't been to one of these. Well, it, it's, it's going to be winding down, so please yeah. um, and, step uh, forward. And uh, I'm Charlie Hone. I live at um, 282 Main Street, so I am an abutting landowner, probably after him, the most affected by this. And, and having not gone through this process before, I'm, I had a bunch of comments about this proposal and why I didn't think it was a good idea that it sounds like aren't appropriate this meeting. So I'll keep this short um, and hope I can come to the next one. Um, what I'll bring up now is that um, I work in conservation totally unrelated to this and I'm not presenting my comments as in from that lens, but um, you know, I'm, I'm a bit frustrated with this because lot one isn't on any of the state layers. It wasn't, I looked at when we bought the house. It, it, it kind of came out of nowhere for us. I even went down into the vault and looked at the um, applications. It's not on there. I see it's on some maps, it's not on others, you know, and I understand that, you know, it existed to them and, and that's valid, but um, <coughs> You know, and, and certainly everyone, the, the idea that surrounds everything in the neighborhood was that that was conserved land. Now we can argue whether it should be or isn't, maybe that's for the next meeting. But in short, if a PUD is something that can be changed because someone wants or needs money, then I have a lot of concerns with that, both with this project and with future precedents. I can't even see ever supporting, you know, I'm just a citizen, but you know, I can't see citizens supporting a PUD when it's just changed, when someone, you know, I don't get to, do that. I don't get some of their land. Why should they? You know, I, I don't know. I'm I'm frustrated. I don't want to be a bad neighbor, but I just think, you know, and, and if the, the proposal does come up that it can be moved somewhere else, then, you know, certainly it doesn't, uh, someone's driveway is a problem, but also cutting that field in half will have, I know it's, it's not Yellowstone, it's a field, I know that, but like cutting a field in half will have ecological impacts, and we've got 350 species we've documented on our land. I'd expect we'd lose some if they did that. I know that maybe again roaming outside the, this meeting, but, so I'll leave it at that. But um, just consider the precedent could be pretty, because I know there's other big parcels of land people talk about developing. And if, if, if when one of those is trying to get developed, it was, well, Murray Hill got to change it 20 years later. I think that would, you know, be a concern. 
well, it, it, it's precedent. You're, you're right that it wouldn't want us to consider, you wouldn't want us to fail to consider the details of this subdivision if the fact that the amendment of the subdivision was going to be used as precedent in the future. And, and I just love my final point is I hope whatever the outcome of this is, there's some clarity. It's, I think it's only fair for the other abutting landowners and other people on Main Street that there's some clarity as to what's going on with that land. You know, because i got to plant a bunch of trees if they're going to develop that whole thing. Like what it sounds like now is they can, can if they decide to later just creep through and develop the whole thing. And I think that's something an abutting landowner deserves to know now, sooner rather than later, so we can plan for that, because that's not what we expected. Can, can you identify where 282 Main is? Can I, um, I think we're going to need that. Yep. Um, yeah, so I'm, there's lot one where it yes. is or isn't, and we're right here, and our house is right here, and all of our house faces this way, and I know this is maybe not a concern for the broader city, but in terms of character of our house, it's devastating. Like, you know, not not survival, but like, mm -hmm. yeah, it'll it'll be a big change. We wanted to live in on the edge of Montpelier, not in Colchester. Could you put your finger on 282 again? This, this one right here. Okay. I, oh, I think it's right. Just, okay. The Murrays. The Murrays. Yeah, the sure. Yes. The Murray family. Right. Okay. And, you know, oh, I mean, okay. they, they deserve the right to go through the process and whatever, you know, I understand it's not just our choice, but I just want to be heard. Okay. We just want to identify where 282 was. Yes, absolutely. Great. And, you know, like I said, I, I really hope we can get some clarity so we understand in, in how we manage our field, whether or not we're going to be able to have that common land continue to exist or if it's going to turn into a Walmart or something. I always thought it was conserved land. I guess it's not. That's disappointing, but what are you going to do? Don't throw that W word around here. Uh, yeah, head. I know. I don't, I don't actually think that would happen. It's just like the M word. Yeah. Yes. No, no, no. Well, at least that would. Yeah. <laughs> So, but as I said to Mr. Varney, we're, we're, we'll get into the weeds and the nuts and bolts on the. the, the the substance of this subdivision at the next hearing. And, and if for some reason I can't come due to like toddler having, is can I it, submit a written comment? Bring your yes. toddler. <laughs> oh, oh, no, That'll that shorten the, the hearing. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have some it wouldn't be two hours long then if we had a two-year-old running around. <laughs> yeah, you can al you can always submit written comments in yes, advance. Yes, yes, I'm sorry, I didn't Thanks. mean to. Okay. Yes, Mr. Notified of, the, of the next meeting. Yes. Did you did, did you sign in on the sign-in sheet? That's right there inside the door. Well, and and you're, Mr. Varney, you're in a butter. Yes. So, so you get the notices just the same way you did. You got a notice this time, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Are people across the Murray, are across the main street considered a butters or not? The road is yes. They are. Yes. Hmm. All right. So this is, um, th as we said, sketch plan review is a characterization of this kind of proceeding, which is re really it's not deliberative and we don't make a decision other than we made a procedural decision t here tonight just to um, <clears throat> inform the applicant how the next hearing will proceed. Um, so we don't really have to close this hearing. We can just end it without a formal proceeding. Which I think we will do. The, the, the hearing of hearing on this application, our meeting is still our, our meeting is going to continue. Yes. Can I just? Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, yeah. Uh, yes. I'm sorry. Um, okay. Hello, my name is Will Shabam, uh, resident of 217 North Street. Not an immediate abutter. Um, also an alternate on the DRB, but uh, I'm here on behalf of uh, a number of residents on North Street and Lower North Franklin. Um, and I wrote basically a letter and a bunch of signatures and uh, just something to consider for um, when you do come to preliminary or the final um, subdivision. So, uh, dear residents of Murray Hill and the Murray Hill Condo Associ Association, we, your neighbors and residents of Lower North Street and North Franklin Street neighborhoods, are very concerned about the small brook that originates at your detention ponds, which collect all of your stormwater. It was once an insignificant stream draining a small watershed prior to development, but now, during heavy rains that happen at least once a year, 
um, which is unfortunately a given from here on out with the way the climate is changing, it becomes a torrential river that is rapidly and dangerously eroding the hillside below the graveyard down to North Street, through to North Franklin, and eventually the Winooski. We are quite concerned about the land on either side of the stream as we watch it, along with many old trees fall into the growing gulch. The hillside is simply washing away. This is a worry for homeowners whose homes sit next to the stream because of likely home damage, flooding, driveways, washing away, even home loss. Um, on top of that, many more people are affected by this problem because so many large rocks and silt get washed down the river and clogging the culvert on North Street. Water, silt, and rocks flow into Main Street, down the length of North Street to Mechanic Street and beyond to Main Street into people's lawns and basements, resulting in significant damage. There's also the larger impact from this runoff on the environment of Lake Champlain Basin. Um, the after effect of this is a few days of work for the City of Montpelier road crew, which at best is a temporary solution, pointless use of our tax dollars, and a lot of cleanup to be done by the residents of Lower North Street. The detention ponds and site work at Murray Hill need to be upgraded so that you are not causing this damage and possibly home loss to your neighbors downstream. Matt Destino from the State Stormwater Division came to take a look and told us that he has asked you to do some maintenance to upgrade things to prevent further damage. Um, we ask that at a minimum you comply with this request, but also ask you to update the detention ponds to, to today's reality, whether or not it is a law to do so. Um, it is damaging to the people downstream and the environment around you if you do not do so. We ask you that you do this as soon as possible before the damage gets significantly worse. Um, so, a variety of signatures on this, and then also personal experience having gone up there after some very heavy rains that clogged the culvert in question. Um, and so. It's not sure when it was built, you know, with the 83, but obviously it's quite a concern, as I'm sure some of you know, it's a significant issue. Um, so I guess I would ask that at the next, you know, maybe some proof at the next meeting, you know, for your uh, final review as proof that you're in compliance with whatever maintenance is needed. As I said, we've spoken with Matt Destino, and I noticed on your permit application that you've been in touch with him as well. Right. So. It, he, he issued an exemption for Lot 1 because it does not drain towards North Street. It drains towards... Yeah, I, I understand that, but um, and I think the stormwater plan for Lot 1 is fine. It sounds totally reasonable. Uh, right. But in regards to, you know, if, you know, the funds from the sale of Lot 1... You know, <coughs> I would recommend that, you know, prior to resurfacing the tennis courts, maybe you would, you know, upgrade your maintenance ponds. Sure excuse me, excuse, to excuse me, folks. Um, we don't have a hearing to allow a dialogue between uh, two witnesses. Um, well, I, I have to tell you that you, um, you can get your nose under the tent flap some places, but not here. Okay. And so if, you're, if your issues are germane to something that's not involved with the subdivision. This is this is not yeah. open I guess I season. Just to bring it to their attention. And then, you know, well, you can send them the letter and yeah. Yeah. pick up the phone. Yeah. That's um, but we don't have any jurisdiction over that compliance in connection with the subdivision. Uh, well, we probably could expand it, but you're going to have to have empirical evidence yeah. to introduce to us yeah. that. The, that the project is not in compliance with its stormwater permit. Yeah. So um, leverage is best exercised face-to-face. -face. Yeah. Okay, sounds so. good. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, folks. We're Thank going to move you. on to other matters on our agenda. Oh. So the other matter on our agenda is 27 School Street. No one ever? Uh, nope. Chris is here. Chris is here. I don't know. He snuck in at some point. Push the pool? <laughs> wow. Hello? Sorry, I missed the beginning. The, when I when this got here late, because uh, if I'd known about that, I would have been early. I'm sorry? If I'd known about the, the the last one, I would have been earlier so that I could have been on first. Apparently, I was on first on the agenda. Yeah. Touch late. <laughs> I started without you. We moved right on. I understand. I understand. Yes. No problem. No. Um, before we begin this matter at nine o'clock, um, Meredith is um, 
Uh, our next regularly scheduled meeting is August 6th? Correct. And then August 20th? Yes. Uh, is the uh, how significant is the agenda for August 6th? One item right now. When will we hear? They have to file a, the final application. They haven't even submitted that yet. Okay. So they have to file an entirely new application. Okay. So they're back to the drawing board and for yes for public notice. And, and so the application that. we have on August 6th is. Um, that is one home farmway. It will be an amendment to a previously issued site plan under the old rules. Okay. So, um, Mr. Pierce. Yes. Um, initiating the conditional use minor site plan and design review at 9 o'clock is... Um, Late. It, it's a big undertaking. Yeah, it is. Uh, um, would you respond? Would you feel like you were less than satisfactorily uh, treated if we asked if you might continue this to August sixth? Um, I, I, I don't have a. Yeah, that'd be fine. All right, I, I think my large, my biggest concern is for my client who would love to get bodies into his apartment. But I think if we are complying with what we assume you think is okay, and we'll just mm -hmm. continue our work and move along so if you're okay with that I'm okay with moving I'm not sure what I'm okay with <laughs> well we're doing <laughs> we're doing some renovations and, and yes. there may be things that are in question about what mm -hmm. we're doing or that you may say yay or nay to um, I would like to complete as much of that as possible in the meantime if, if, uh, if that's okay mm -hmm. Mr. Chair, well, if I can make a yeah. maybe a modest suggestion, um, is we could swear the witness in, have him give a description of the project, um, generally consistent, so that if we have any concerns or questions, we could ask them now and then continue the sort of in the weeds, in depth review to the August 6th hearing. That would give the applicant, while not a legal ground, to go forward necessarily at least a, enough of a weather report from us um, so that if he had to make minor undoable cha changes that could be undone, um, he could do so in the 20 some odd days between now and August 6th. I, I'm agreeable to that. Please raise your right hand. You solemnly swear the evidence you're about to give on the matter under consideration is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Yes, I do. Thank you. You're Chris Pierce. You're here on behalf of Key Turner Properties, LLC. Yes, I am. Great. Why don't you tell us what the plan involves, the project involves? Well, um, I don't know if you have a picture of the building there, but um, we, my client purchased the building thinking it only needed a few items and it turns out it needed a complete renovation from literally anything that we opened up was rotted, needed to be uh, replaced. So uh, we went ahead and gutted the building and in doing so we realized that there was this beautiful attic that we'd like to add at the sixth residence. It's currently five, a uh, five unit apartment and has been for I think since the 70s maybe. Yep. Um, it, it does have uh, enough parking currently to manage um, that many people. Uh, we have gotten a, um, uh, a sprinkler um, waiver. Uh, waiver so we don't have to do the sprinkler if we put two means of egress in. One being interior, so that doesn't affect really any of the exterior that may be in question, but the, there is a secondary deck. Sec the secondary egress uh, would be a deck that's in the application um, and a spiral staircase. That, um, those are the two big ones that we'd love to continue with. Um, windows have been um, replaced. Uh, they match the same windows, however, they're not wood. They don't match to uh, mm -hmm. the original antique windows, but that's 
a uh, financial hardship to try and do that in the amount that needed to be replaced. Um, but that's really, that's the big, I think that's the big item is the, 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 uh, the uh, addition of a, a third floor deck mm -hmm. and spiral staircase. I think the rest of it, um, you know, landscaping and whatnot is tertiary, doesn't matter too much. And just remind me if you've added the laundry room. I have not added the laundry room. That's another one I keep forgetting about. The, yeah, because that's an addition to the yeah, building envelope, although right. not the building footprint. Right. It's a, it's actually a, a it's, it's not really part of the envelope, but it, it's its own envelope, but it looks like it's part of oh. because it's separately built on a separate foundation, but it will integrate to the building to look like it is part of <coughs> the building itself. You have a comment. that we can put a, we can put that off. That doesn't really matter too much because that's exterior work. What my biggest the what I really like to get is a CO. I don't need that for a CO. I don't need for a certificate of occupancy. I don't need a laundry room. I do need to have egresses completed, um, handrails, and minor things like that that are exterior that you might care about. Well, I, I can tell you that so. I, if I'm not mistaken. If we hear this on August 6th yeah. and issue a, an opinion on August 10th, mm -hmm. the, the decision, the permit's not final for 30 days. Mm -hmm. And I don't believe you'll get a certificate of occupancy until the 30 days has True. expired. Okay. September 6th. We could at least show the building. <laughs> I feel like I'm, you're selling me a car. Um, <laughs> I used to do that. <laughs> so did I. Uh, okay, perfect. Um, <laughs> but they were. <laughs> um, so it, really, I mean, there's not much we can give you in the way of a of assurance or moral support to this. Um, I guess if there's anything that's just, you know, red flag, don't do this. I'd love to know it. As a matter of fact, did you read the staff report? Right. No. Ah, if you read the staff report, the staff comments are in red. Oh. So there, there are no. I don't have. There's no. Have. There, there's no flags waving. Okay. But it does point out. Um, I can give them this. Omissions I, I was or. Feel free. He's, omissions he's or uh, further information oh, that should be introduced. Long day. And in our proceedings, we the. The staff report would generally guide us toward issues that need further information and clarification. And okay. um, if we were to proceed tonight to the extent that the staff report identifies sure. information that's not presently in the record, yeah. then you would find yourself continued to August 6th in any event. Okay. You can use this as a template or as a, uh, as a menu of... Um, and direction for completing this, the materials bef that have been submitted. Um, may I just go ahead? So, Chris, this is um, because there were some. After I sent the staff report to the applicants, there was some email correspondence on which I was copied, but I am not allowed to present at this point. <clears throat> that it was too yeah, it came too late. That pointed out where there was discussion of where the issues were, and I believe, Chris, that. That correspondence has a right. lot of the issues that were highlighted in red here addressed. And it may have been with the owner. Um, I. Okay. Sure, sure. The correspondence included you. Yes. All of this. Okay. Do you need so, this? Well, it, a copy. Yeah, I mean, I'm in case sure you did available. not bring it with you. So anyway, well, so it, it is available. I do have um, But I guess the point is that continuing you to August sixth is probably beneficial mm -hmm. at this sure. point because it allows you to. Mm -hmm. Clean up loose ends. Mm -hmm. So, but okay. I, we can't give you any assurances about the deck or the the circular stairway. And um, at this point, okay. Best we can do then. Well, yeah, we wouldn't want you to rely upon a representation okay. that we're. Sure. Don't come back in August. We'll give you the permit then. It's really it's not the way we. Um, we pride on ourselves on being thorough. We have done this kind of backwards. This whole project just kept snowballing, and the permit went from heat and um, a minor bathroom move to 
knocking down walls, re-engineering the interior of the building. So it's gone. I think I saw the sills last spring. Yeah, I mean, it's... a walk one Sunday and... you got to feel bad for the guy. I mean, yes. it's, it's <laughs> terrible. Well, I, so. I feel really good about myself because we looked at that building in um, 1985 <laughs> when Stan Granfield was thinking about selling it. Oh, boy. Feeling really good that better I... Better back then. We sure. moved down the street. So. <laughs> All right, is there a motion to continue the Key Turner oh. Properties LLC application to August 6th? I'll make a motion to continue it to August 6th. I'll second. Motion by Dan, second by Jack. All those in favor of the motion, please signify by raising their right hands. Great. Thank you, Chris. We'll see you then. Okay. Thank you. Roger. You can start your U.S. history. Huh? How's your U.S. history? What, what do you mean? August 6th. Water paper company? Okay. Um, Angola Gay. Huh? We do, we do tend to be on the <clears throat> We'll need a little copy. Dropping the bottom. And come back. Oh. Yes. Right. Thank you. Thank you. I'll I make a motion to adjourn. Oh, I'm sorry. Second. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor of the motion, please signify by raising your right hands. We are adjourned. <laughs>